Hi, I am Lynn Clark, and I make code cartoons. And I also work at Mozilla, where I'm in the Emerging Technologies group. So that's things like the Rust programming language and WebAssembly, which is a fast way to run languages other than JavaScript in the browser. And we also work on Servo, which is a new web engine. And I'll be talking about all of those things today because they're all part of the future of the browser. So why talk about the future of the browser? Because browsers are facing a challenge right now. And whether or not browsers meet this challenge could change the web as we know it. So what is this challenge? Browsers need to get faster. Content, content on the web has changed a lot since the early days of the web. In the early days of the web, speed really didn't matter that much. We were just looking at static documents. So as soon as that document was rendered to the screen, the browser was pretty much done with its work. It might need to do a little work when you scrolled or something like that, but nothing too complicated. Then people started pushing the boundaries. They started thinking, what can we do with this web besides just delivering static documents? Pages started getting interactive. They started having animations. For example, do you remember when everybody went drop down crazy and people created those fancy slide down menus with jQuery all over the place? Once those were part of the page, the web page wasn't just being rendered once. It wasn't just being painted once to the browser. With every change, it needed to be repainted. And sometimes when you had these animations, the screen needed to be repainted multiple times for a single change. It needed to be repainted to show that motion. So for one change, there were multiple repaints. If you wanted interactions or animations to look smooth, these repaints needed to be happening at a certain rate. The screen needed to be repainted 60 times per second. So that meant that you only had 16 milliseconds to get all of that work done. So browsers made all sorts of changes to come up to speed and to accommodate these new applications to get up to that 60 frames per second. But as is the way with the web, content authors started pushing these boundaries even further. They started not just making their web pages, their web applications more interactive, but bringing a whole new class of application to the web. Things like PC games. And companies started talking about bringing applications like Photoshop to the web. These new classes of applications are taxing the web even further. And they're making clear that things like JavaScript need to be even faster. It's not just content authors that are pushing these boundaries either. It's also the hardware vendors. Oops. For example, the new iPad is going from 60 frames per second to 120 frames per second. So that means that the browser has half as much time to do the same amount of work. And new kinds of content are coming to the web and pushing this even more. For example, with VR, you have two different displays, one for each eye. And each of these has to be going at at least 90 frames per second to avoid motion sickness. Plus, each of those displays may have a resolution of up to 4K, which means that you have lots and lots more pixels that you need to display. Let's think about what this change means. If we're running a website on a 13-inch MacBook Pro, we have 16 milliseconds to fill in about 4 million pixels. With the next iPad, you have half as much time, you have eight milliseconds to fill in three million pixels. And with a VR experience, you have 11 milliseconds to fill in up to 16.5 million pixels. And this doesn't even include any heavier JavaScript needs that you might have with an application like that. That's a huge leap that browsers need to make in order to keep up. What happens if browsers don't keep up? Well, as more and more people buy these new devices, and as more and more content moves into these heavier applications, if browsers don't keep up, people might stop seeing the web as the default place to put their content. And this could mean that the web as we know it withers, which is a pretty scary thought. But to be honest, I'm not too worried. I'm confident that browsers can make this leap 
And the reason I'm confident is that at Mozilla, we've been preparing for this for the last 10 years. We've been looking at the direction that computer hardware is going, and we've been figuring out the new way that we need to program, the new way that we need to code the browser to keep up with these changes. The answer is parallelism. The future of the browser is parallel. We've only just started taking advantage of this in Firefox, but we're already seeing big wins from it. And every indication is that this new way of doing things can get the browser where it needs to be. So in this talk, I want to explain exactly what browsers need to change in order to make this leap. But before I do that, let's talk a little bit about what the browser actually does. I'm going to start with the rendering engine, which is the most important part of the browser, because it's the part that takes your HTML and CSS and turns it into pixels on the screen. It does this in five steps. But to make it simpler, I can split it up into two groups. The first group takes the HTML and CSS and figures out a plan. It figures out what the page should look like. So it's kind of like a blueprint. It specifies where everything goes on the screen, like widths and heights and colors and all of that information. The second group takes that plan and turns it into the pixels that you see on the screen. Now let's look more closely at each step in the process. The first step is called parsing. What the parser does is turn HTML into something that the browser can understand. Because when this HTML comes in, it's just one big long string of text. It's kind of like a big long paper ribbon that just has all of these characters all in a row. But what we need is something different. Something that the browser can actually use a data structure that tells us what the different elements on the page are and how they're related to each other. I think of this kind of like a family tree. We need to turn this long paper ribbon into a family tree of the page. So what the parser does is it goes along this ribbon with a pair of scissors. When it sees the opening tag for an HTML element, something like a div, it cuts it out and puts it into the family tree. And then the next element will go under that div. Let's say the next element is a paragraph. That p tag will go under the div. And there will be a line between them to show the parent-child relationship between them. This family tree is called the DOM tree, the document object model. And it's called that because it provides a model of the document, which we can use to make any changes that we want to to the document. So if JavaScript wants to change what shows up on the page, it can make the cha that change to this family tree. So for example, if we don't want some of the paragraphs anymore, we remove them from the family tree. And then they'll disappear from the screen. At the end of parsing, we have this family tree, the DOM tree, that tells us about the structure of the page and the parent-child relationships. What it doesn't tell us is what these things should look like. In order to figure that out, in order to figure out what they look like, we need to take the CSS that we've downloaded and figure out which styles apply to which elements. So that's the next step, CSS style computation. I think of CSS style computation like a person filling in a form for each one of these elements in the tree. And that form is going to say exactly what that element should look like. And it has more than 200 form fields on it. There's a form field for every single CSS property. And this form needs to be filled in completely for each one of the elements in this tree. So at the end of CSS style computation, each element has its form filled out with all of the CSS property values. But there's still a little more that we need to figure out here. We need to figure out how wide and how high things are going to be and where they'll be on the page. The next step, layout, takes care of this. It looks at the dimensions of the browser window. And from that, it calculates those relative values, like if a div is 50% of its parent. It will also do things like break up a paragraph element into multiple elements, one for each line in the paragraph. That way, it knows how many lines high the box needs to be. The output of this step is another tree. In Firefox, we call it the frame tree, but it's called the render tree or box tree in other browsers. Whatever it's called, this is the ultimate plan. This is what tells us exactly what the page should look like. So now we can move on to the next part of rendering, which is turning that plan into pixels. 
Filling in pixels can take a long time, especially when there are a lot of things rapidly changing on a page. And because of this, browsers have tried to find ways to reduce the work and make this faster. One way that they've done this is by splitting up what gets shown into multiple different layers. So these are layers that like what you have in Photoshop. Or I think of them like the layers that they had in old timey animation, like the onion skin layers that they used to do Bugs Bunny cartoons. You have a background on one layer, and then you have the characters on other layers. Then if the characters move, you don't need to repaint the background. The background layer can just stay the same. Only the top layer needs to change. So the first step in this process is called painting, and that's where you actually create those layers. The next step is called compositing, and that's where you take these layers and you put them together, and then you basically take a picture of them from above and put that on the screen. And that's how the page gets rendered. Now I framed this as the way that a web page's content goes from HTML and CSS to pixels. But what you might not know is that there's another part of the browser, the tabs, the URL bar, all of that stuff. And that part is actually separate. It's called the browser Chrome. In some browsers, such as Firefox, rendering browser Chrome is also handled by the rendering engine. So you have this rendering engine, and it has two different tasks. It has to render the inside of the window, which is called the content, and the outside, which is called the Chrome. And actually, it's not just two tasks. Because for any tab that you have open, there's going to be a new content window. Even if its pixels aren't showing because it's not the selected tab, it could still be running JavaScript. So this means that the browser has multiple things to do. And they're all pretty independent of each other. This is one of the earliest places where you saw parallelism in a browser. In 2008, you started seeing a browser take advantage of new hardware to run these tasks at the same time, independently. But it wasn't us that did that. It was Chrome. When Chrome launched, its architecture was already using parallelism like this. It's called the multi-process architecture. And it's one of the reasons why Chrome was faster and more responsive than Firefox when it was released. Now, I feel like I should take a step back here and explain what this all really means. What hardware change specifically Chrome was taking advantage of and what that change made possible. So let's do a little crash course in computers and how they work. So you can think of a computer kind of like you think of a brain. There are different parts to this brain. There's the part that does the thinking. So that's things like addition, subtraction, logical operations like and and or. And then there's some short-term memory. And these two are close together in the same part of the brain. And then there's long-term memory. These different parts have names. So the part that does the thinking, that's called the arithmetic and logic unit, the ALU. The short-term memory, those are called registers. And these two are grouped together on something called the central processing unit, or CPU. And the long-term memory is called random access memory, or RAM. Now, in order to get this brain to do anything, we have to give it an instruction. This instruction is going to tell us what we need to do with some bit of the short-term memory. Each box of the short-term memory has a label, and that means that we can refer to it. So we can use those labels in instructions to say which value that instruction should be acting on. For example, we could add a number to a value that's in short-term memory to get the result. So we could add 1 to the value that's in R4. One thing that you may have figured out from this is that we can only do one thing at a time. This brain can only think one thought at a time. And that was really true of most computers, from the earliest computers, until about the mid-2000s. But even though these computers had had that limitation for all of these years, they were still getting faster. Every 18 months to two years, they were getting twice as fast. You could run twice as many instructions in the same amount of time. What made it possible for these computers to get faster was something called Moore's Law. The little electrical circuits that you use to make the different parts of the CPU were getting smaller and smaller. And that meant more and more of them could fit on a single chip. With more and more of these building blocks, you can make these CPUs more powerful. And also, there's less distance for the electricity to travel between them. So they were able to work together faster. 
But of course, you can only make things so small. And there's only so much electricity that you can course through a circuit before it starts burning up. In the early 2000s, these limitations were becoming apparent. Chip manufacturers had to think, how are they going to keep making faster and faster chips? And the answer that they came up with was splitting the chip into more than one brain, basically making it possible to think more than one thought at a time in parallel. These separate brains that the CPU has are called cores. So when you hear people talk about a multi-core architecture, that's what they're talking about. Even though each one of these cores or brains is limited in how fast it can think, if you add more of them, they can do more in the same amount of time. But the thing is, in order to take advantage of this, you need to be able to split up the work that you have to do across these different cores. Unlike before, where the speed ups were happening without programmers having to do anything, these speed ups actually require programmers to change the way that they write code. This is actually harder to do than you might think. Imagine that two of these cores need to work on the same bit of long-term memory. They both need to add something to it. What number is going to end up in long-term memory at the end of the calculation? Who knows? It depends on the timing of when the instructions run on the different cores. So let's walk through an example of this. We'll start with number eight in long-term memory. Both cores need to add one to it, so our end result should be 10. Instructions have to use things that are in the short-term memory, and each core has its own short-term memory. So let's say that the first core pulls eight from long-term memory into its short-term memory, then it adds one to get nine, and then it replaces the value in long-term memory. This means that the other cores can now access that result of the operation too. So long-term memory holds nine now. Then the second core pulls nine from long-term memory into short-term memory. It adds one to get 10, and then it writes back to long-term memory. So this means that our end result is 10. So all is well. But it wasn't guaranteed to end up that way. Let's see what happens when the instructions run in a different order. The first core pulls eight from long-term memory. Then the second core pulls eight from long-term memory. You might already see the problem here. The first core adds one to get nine. Then it writes nine back to long-term memory. Then the second core adds one to get nine. And then it writes nine back to get into long-term memory. So we end up with a result of nine, which is not what we wanted. This kind of bug is called a data race. When you have parallel code with shared memory, so two different cores that are working with the same part of long-term memory at the same time, you're very likely to have these data races. One way to get around this is to choose tasks for parallelization that are pretty independent of each other so that they don't need to share memory. Now let's go back to the Chrome and content example that we were looking at before. You might remember that I said that these are all fairly independent of each other. That means that they're perfect for this kind of parallelism, where you don't need to share memory between them. And this is called coarse-grained parallelism. That's where you split up your program into some pretty large tasks that can be done independently of each other, but at the same time. It's actually reasonably straightforward to do this kind of parallelism. You just need to figure out those large independent tasks. So Chrome had this from the beginning. The Chrome engineer saw that they were going to need to have some amount of parallelism to be fast with these new architectures. Around the same time that Chrome was seeing this change in hardware and seeing that if, if they wanted to have a fast browser, they were going to have to take advantage of this parallelism, we were seeing the same thing. We knew that we were going to have to have this coarse-grained parallelism in our browser too if we were going to keep up. And we do know now, although it took us a little bit of time to get there, it was a multi-year effort. We started testing our multi-process architecture in Firefox 48 with a small test group of users. But it wasn't until this past summer with Firefox 54 that we turned it on for all users. It took us a while to get there because we weren't starting fresh like Chrome was. We had a bit of a bumpier road. <laughs> 
We were starting with this existing code base, which was developed before multi-core architectures were common. And we needed to figure out how to break apart this code base without breaking anything for our users in the process. So we needed a plan for that. But we didn't just stop at making plans for adding coarse-grained parallelism to the browser. We saw that we were going to need to take it further. Because when you have this kind of coarse-grained parallelism, there's a good chance you're still not making the best use of all of your cores, of all of the hardware that's available to you. For example, you might have one tab that's doing a whole lot of work. But the others might not be doing much at all. That means those other cores are sitting idle. So you're not getting the kind of speed up that you could get from a parallel architecture. We saw that if we wanted to make a browser that was really fast, we couldn't just add coarse grain parallelism. We needed to add fine grained parallelism too. So what is fine grained parallelism? Well, that's when you take one of these big tasks and you split it up into smaller tasks that can be more easily split up, split up across these different brains, across the different cores that you have. But that usually does mean that you're going to have to share memory, as I was talking about before. And this opens you up to those data races. These data races are nearly impossible to avoid when you have shared memory. And they're incredibly tricky to debug. The thinking at the, at the time was basically that to safely program in parallel, you kind of had to have a wizard level understanding of the language. One of the distinguished engineers at Mozilla actually put a sign about eight feet high saying, you must be this tall in order to write multi-threaded code. Now, of course, when you have a project like an open source browser, where you have these thousands of engineers at all different skill levels contributing to the code base, you, don't, you just don't have the option of coding in a way that requires a wizard level understanding of the language. If you do, you're going to run into these data races for sure. And these data races and other memory bugs cause some of the worst security vulnerabilities in browsers. So if we wanted to take advantage of this fine-grained parallelism without the peril that the data races introduce, we couldn't just start hacking a parallel version of the browser. We had to find a way to make it safe. So rather than starting a project to rewrite the browser, we started sponsoring a project to create a new language to write that browser in. This language is the Rust programming language. As part of its design, it makes sure that these kinds of data races don't happen. If you have code that would result in these kinds of data races, it just won't compile. We started sponsoring work on Rust around 2009 or 2010. It wasn't until 2013 that we actually started putting it to use for a browser, though, to see whether or not it could create the kind of browser that we wanted. I don't know if you've heard of the term yak shaving, where you have to do one seemingly unrelated task before you get to the thing that you really wanted to do. Well, at Mozilla, we have some pretty big yaks to shave. So in 2013, with this language in hand that allowed us to code in parallel without fear, we started looking at how we could really introduce fine grained parallelism into the browser engine. And the project that we started to do this is called Servo. It started by looking at this rendering engine pipeline and asking, what if we parallelize all of the things? This means we're not just sending the different content windows with different pages to different cores. We're taking a single content window and splitting up the different parts of that page. This means that if you have a site like Pinterest, each different pinned item can be processed separately from the others. For example, for CSS, you could send each pinned item to get a CSS filled out by a different core. This means you can speed up different parts of the rendering engine by however many cores you have, which means that as chip manufacturers, ma manufacturers add more and more cores into the future, these pages are going to get faster and faster without the programmer having to do anything. This is the key. This is why this fine-grained parallelism is so important. This is why we spent so much time and risked so much in pursuing it. Because it wasn't clear at the start of this work that it was actually going to work. Coarse grain parallelism is pretty straightforward, but this fine grain parallelism, creating a language that would support it and then actually implementing a browser that used it, that was a tough research problem. But the time and effort has paid off. <laughs>
We found out that these ideas work and that they work really well. Over the past year, we started bringing pieces of this over to Firefox. We were doing this as part of Project Quantum, which is a major speed up of Firefox that we started working on about a year and a half ago. It was kind of like replacing the parts of a jet engine mid-flight. And the first release of Firefox Quantum came out in November. One thing that we brought over is our parallel style engine called Stylo. That splits up all of the CSS processing across the different CPU cores, as I mentioned before. It uses a technique called work stealing to split up that work. Whenever a core runs out of work, it can steal work from the other cores. And this makes splitting up work efficient. It makes it possible to speed up that CSS style computation by however many CPU cores you have. Another piece that we're bringing over is called WebRender. WebRender takes the paint and composite stages and combines them together into a rendering stage. It uses the hardware in a smart way to make painting the pixels faster, which means it can keep up with those larger displays. To do this, it uses another highly parallelized part of the computer, which is specifically meant for graphics. This is called the GPU, or the Graphics Processing Unit. The cores on the GPU are different from the cores on the CPU. Instead of having two or four or six of them, like on a CPU, there are hundreds of or even thousands of them. But they can't do things independently. They have to all be working on the same thing at the same time. You need to do a lot of planning if you want to maximize the amount of work that they can do at the same time. And that's what WebRender does. With WebRender, we can get rid of performance cliffs that trip up web developers. For example, if you animate background color right now, it can make your animation start and stop. It can make it look janky because the paint and composite phase have too much work to do. Because of this, there are currently a lot of rules about what you should and shouldn't animate. We're going to be able to get rid of a lot of these rules so that web developers don't need to hack around these performance cliffs. We can take pages that render in Chrome or the previous version of Firefox at around 15 frames per second and bring them up to maximum FPS, whether that's 60 or 120 frames per second. But it's not just the browser's own code that the browser is going to need to run faster. It's also going to need to run application code faster. And what I'm talking about here is stuff like JavaScript. The JavaScript engine is a part of the browser that I haven't mentioned yet. So let's see where that fits in. JavaScript gives you a way to change the document object model, so that thing that you built up during the parsing phase. When you change it, it triggers the creation of a new version of the page through this rendering pipeline. A lot of sites these days are pretty JavaScript heavy. That's where they spend a lot of the time that they have, a lot of that 16 milliseconds that they have to figure out what the next version of the page should look like. These sites are using frameworks like React, which does a lot of calculations in JavaScript to figure out what it needs to change in the DOM tree. Now, browsers can make the JavaScript engines that run this JavaScript faster. But JavaScript isn't really designed for machines to be able to run it quickly. It's designed to be easy for humans to write. The way that JS engines get fast is by making guesses about where the, the JS engine can take a shortcut with your code to run your code faster. But sometimes these shortcuts don't actually work for your code. And there are only so many shortcuts that the engine can take, which means that there's only so much that the, Java, the JS engine can do to speed up this application code. But what if app code could run in parallel? What if app code could take advantage of the multiple cores in the same way that the browser's own code can? Over the past few years, browsers have been adding features to make this possible. One of these features that you may have heard of is called web workers. These have been in browsers for a few years now. They allow you to have JS code which runs on different cores. You may also have heard of shared array buffers, which started landing in browsers this past summer. Now, unfortunately, I've had to add a caveat in this talk because of the Spectre bug. Uh, the Spectre bug, which happened in January of this year, you may have heard of it. Um, because of that bug, all of the browsers had to turn off shared array buffers. 
But we are optimistic that we're going to find a way to get them turned on again. What shared array buffers do is they give you that shared memory that I was talking about before, which you need for speed a lot of times when you're working with the fine grained parallelism. But like I talked about before, it's pretty tricky to actually manage that fine grained parallelism, that shared memory on your own. And web workers can also be hard to use. That's why so few sites and applications use them today, even though they've been around for years. It would be nice to have a language like Rust, which gives you those guarantees that you're not going to have the data races, and which makes it easy to split work across different cores, across the different workers. Well, there's actually another standard that landed in browsers this past year which helped with this. WebAssembly makes it possible to run other languages besides just JavaScript in the browser. Now, it doesn't quite have access, direct access, to the DOM yet, but the working group is working on it. And they're already very close to finishing work on threading once we get shared array buffers turned back on. And that will make it possible to have that fine-grained shared memory uh, across different cores. There are also other things about WebAssembly that help application performance. It was designed for machines to run it quickly, not to be easy for humans to read and write. Because web, dev web developers don't have to write WebAssembly directly. They're usually writing in another language that compiles to WebAssembly, something like Rust. That means that WebAssembly doesn't have to be easily readable for programmers. And this means that the engine doesn't have to do the guesswork that it has to do with JavaScript. This speed of WebAssembly, even without threading, is what's making it possible to run PC games in the browser today. So these standards, web workers and shared array buffer and WebAssembly, they make it possible for applications to take advantage of parallelism too. For example, in a framework like React, you could write the core algorithm in parallel. That way the work to figure out the changes between the previous version of the app and the next version of the app could be distributed across all of your cores. Ember is already starting to experiment with WebAssembly in their Glimmer VM, which may be able to take advantage of parallelism in this way as well. I think we're going to see a big shift towards using these standards and frameworks over the next few years. So let's get back to this challenge that we had. Here are the pieces of the puzzle. Here is how we address this challenge. This is what browsers need to do to support the new devices and the new kinds of content that are coming to the web. There's the coarse grain parallelism of splitting up the different content windows and the Chrome among different processes. There's the fine grain parallelism of splitting up the work of a single web page so it can be distributed across the different cores. And then there's enabling application code to be parallelized as well. The core screen parallelism is already there in all of the browsers. Chrome was the first to do it, but pretty much all of the browsers have caught up at this point. Enabling application code to go parallel, that's something that's happening in standards bodies and is being adopted by all of the major browsers. It's this fine-grained parallelism that's still a question mark. This is where most of browsers have done the least so far, and it's actually not clear how to do it in most browsers. Because the C++ that most browsers are written in is actually pretty hard to parallelize in this way. But I think that all browsers are going to need to do this. We may be the first browser to get there. We may be the first to have this fine grained parallelism in place and deliver the speed ups that we can with fine grained parallelism. But we really want all of the browsers to get there too and to get there with us. Because that's the way we're going to keep the web going. That's how we're going to keep the web healthy and vibrant, no matter how much the browser's limits are pushed. Thank you to Estelle and to Perf Matters for having me, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>